All right, everyone, thank you. Please be seated. Um, welcome to the afternoon session on placemaking for healthy communities. Um, one of the reasons why uh, we brought Cynthia from Project for Public Spaces here um, is that we thought it was a perfect nexus um, between our beautification efforts and our new healthy community efforts. It just so happens that Project for Public Spaces um, has been doing placemaking for a long time. Um, but they just recently uh, released a publication, um, Placemaking for Healthy Communities. So they're taking their placemaking principles and translating it into um, opportunities and strategies to not only make uh, communities more beautiful and more uh, sociable with linkages, um, but also to make them more healthy um, as well. So I'm going to welcome uh, up to the podium uh, again our keynote speaker, uh, Cynthia Nikitin. Thank you. I hope your clicker works. <laughs> All right. We are praying to the clicker gods that the clickers work. Um, do you all want to move up a little bit or in a little bit or kind of like create sort of a critical mass of... I won't... I won't well, I will call on you, but not quite yet. Oh, great. So um, on the table to the right, I can actually I can give these out. I'll give these out now. So if you didn't get a Healthy Places action packet, you can come up and they're on, they're on the stage as, as well as our Healthy Places audit. Um, and we just released a, um, a, a book, it's available online, um, about, that was funded actually by the Bass Foundation, and it's the case for Healthy Places, and it shows how the social determinants of health can be improved by taking a place-based, placemaking approach. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm just going to do a little bit about pub public health, and then I'm going to move more into, into placemaking. I don't know how many of you were here last year or saw Mark Fenton's keynote. So this will come as a bit of a, re a refresher for that. Um, but 80% of a person's health is impacted by their behavior, social and economic factors, and the physical environment. And only 20% of health is dependent on access to care and quality of care. Yet, as we can see, the billions of dollars we spend each year on health care, more, healthcare, more than 20, 90 percent is devoted um, to that quality of care instead of the areas of behavior, social, economic, and physical environment. They often say that the biggest determinant of your health is your, it's not your blood pressure, it's your, it's your zip code is actually one of the key indicators of, of, of health. So we have been designing our communities uh, and neighborhoods that lack connected streets, which create longer distances between destinations, and force people onto the street or into their cars. And instead of gridded streets that our communities were historically built with. So when we talk about complete streets, we're lo really looking at reconnecting this network of streets that connect homes to shops to schools to businesses to make it easier for people to walk and bike. So complete streets is it's great as a planning idea and is encouraging walking and biking, but it's really about reconnecting our communities together to destinations. Um, so it's regridding the streets as well. So we have not really been designing our places to support health. We have plentiful choice and unhealthy cheap food around us at all times. 
Um, health practitioners will tell you the first step towards health is really what you put in your body and what you eat. So food is really a key element of that as well. We love this picture. We've designed routine physical, you know, even where you'd least expect it. I love this. This is just great. I don't know what to say. I'll just let it speak for itself. 24 hours. It's open 24 hours. That's a good thing. And social isolation is also increasingly a problem um, as well, in, especially for seniors and elders and more vulnerable people. So the results that, you know, you've seen this before. Um, Mississippi and is always like one of the most obese states, and then they're really happy when Alabama is the most obese state, and then it goes back to Mississippi, and Sullivan County was the least healthy county, and I think now you're the second least healthy county. Um, this is, you know, you have nowhere to go but up, I guess is the positive message there. And I know Mark talked about this, but this rapid decline um, in the number of, of percentage of families that let their kids walk to school or a bike precipitously um, has declined in the past two generations, which is part of that as well. And health care costs, um, it's, treating, it's uh, now 17% of our U.S. Gross, gross domestic product. Treating chronic diseases accounts for 86% of our national health care costs today. And the direct medical costs associated with obesity alone are more than $150 billion a year. We just can't, we just can't afford this anymore. So it's really about turning things around. And as you can see from this diagram, it's a, it's a collaborative, holistic, multidimensional, collaborative, you know, kind of participatory um, process. So talking, this was a Surgeon General a few years ago, talking about prevention. Um, and we're really looking at the things that support and are related to the, the role of the built environment in turning, in turning this around. And really making the healthy choice the easy choice, because everyone likes to do things the easy way. So how do we make being healthy the easy thing to do? So our Healthy Places program looks at improving health, looking tying placemaking to public health, breaking down silos, um, and specifically looking at food and transportation, which is about access to healthy food, and empowering the communities themselves to be involved in the process. So over the long term, you know, we are, our goal is to reverse childhood obesity. These are all the big goals, reducing automobile dependency. And these are also goals of our organization, which was founded in 19... Um, 75 as well, a lot of the same overlapping goals. But in the short term, because we like to think about the short term, um, is really looking at how do we improve streets, how do we increase the number of markets and provide access to markets, how do we build the partnerships to support prolonged efforts that will last through municipal elections um, and election cycles. And then how do we change policy to support this new approach and this new sort of silo-busting collaborative way of thinking? So, you know, if you think about a community, and I showed you those little bubble diagrams earlier, here you have a map, and this is where the fitness classes are there, and the playground is there, and the market is there, and the school garden is there, and the complete street is over there. And they're all there. All the little dots are there but they're not really connected. It's sort of like the cohesion piece hasn't been happening. So the food people do the market, the schools doing stuff at the schools with the kids, the parks people working on parks, um, and everyone's kind of doing really good work, and they might even know that each other is doing it. But what doesn't happen is we don't cluster these things together to create these multi-purpose, vibrant, healthy-feeling places where you co-locate, and this is the kind of planning that we do. We take all of these ideas and we figure out what goes next to what. And we're always very big looking at how people use, use a space. So if you have uh, the bike share, well, it makes sense to have the complete street with the bike routes next to the bike share parking. 
Um, if you have the farmer's market, why not have the community garden next to the farmer's market so some of the fruits and vegetables could be actually sold at the farmer's market? If you have a children's playground, why don't you have the adult exercise near it so that the adults exercising can watch their kids? A um, colleague of mine who's with the Texas Institute for Public Health um, is designing these walking trails around playgrounds. So, and this, is, this was in a Muslim community where women are not really encouraged to do physical activity, but because the walking trail was around the playgrounds, the moms, the grandmothers, the daughters would be walking around and around and around, talking, kibitzing, keeping eyes on their kids, but getting their exercise too. Another idea with playgrounds is to disaggregate the equipment. So you have the, the seesaw over here, blah, blah, blah. and then like, I don't know, 100 yards away, quarter of a mile away, um, you have the jungle gym, and the kids have to run to that. And then another 300 yards, there's another piece, the slide. So the kids are not just going from one piece of playground equipment to another. They're actually moving, running, jumping, dragging their families, running and jumping behind them to the next piece of play equipment which actually builds in another level of activity around play. And then if you have the walking trail around that, and then you have the food truck and you have the picnic area where they can have lunch, and even if there's a beer garden and the parents are really happy, or at least a coffee cart, or the dog run is nearby and the dog can do their thing, you layer all these things together. And that becomes a way to keep a family active and involved for like four hours a day instead of about 30 minutes. So we're always looking at how do you co-locate what goes, what goes next to what. And that's sort of the planning. So always thinking about these things instead of like, yeah, we got it all. It's all here. No, but it might not be in the right place. So what's the right place? And is that a vacant parking lot? Um, or is that along a riverfront? Or where, where could that happen? Always mush things up together. Ten things mush together. It's kind of a... So here's an idea of another, um, another example of that, co-locating this healthy food hub. So let's say you do have a farmer's market. All right, what are 10 things? If you've got farmer's market, it's really about health, access to food, food safety, reducing food deserts, food security. So you have the community garden. Okay, cool. Um, but what if you also, we saw that today, they were doing blood pressure testing. What if the farmer's market, there was uh, blood pressure testing? What if the... Um, uh, there was, you know, the truck eye exams. You could get free eye exams. Um, you could get women's health testing at the farmer's market. You could be tested for diabetes as well. There could be physicians there. There could be a clinic. There could be a way to get your eyeglasses or your hearing aid as well. But then playing on the food, could be, there be a value-added food production, a, a commercial kitchen that people could rent for cooking classes or to start food-related healthy businesses. Um, can we put a bus stop there? Can we talk to the transit agency that people that don't have cars can actually get to the farmer's market by public transit? So you think about these 10 other things that can happen around a market that are related to health. Yes, of course, there's music, and of course, there's tomato tasting contests um, and things like that, and things for kids' activities as well. But thinking about how do we get the health sector, the public health service providers to the market so that you go, the, the market becomes part of a healthy hub, healthy food hub. So growing those things together. This is an example. Um, this was uh, in a neighborhood in Detroit, Peaches and Greens, and it was the Christian Community Development Corporation. This was what they had in this neighborhood. This neighborhood had drugs, it had gangs, it had crime, it had a lot of poverty, a lot of unemployment, and a lot of fiercely devoted people who loved their neighborhood. One thing they did have was they had this produce store, peaches and greens. And when I was talking earlier about building on your assets, this is like it. This was it. But the idea here, and this was also funded by the Kresge Foundation, um, this work, was to turn this into a community center and a healthy food hub and to try to use fruits and vegetables to turn around the entire neighborhood, to get rid of crime and prostitution and drugs and gangs, and it sounds insane, um, you know, that uh, the lowly potato can do that, but you have to start somewhere, but their vision was enormous. So it wasn't just we want more people eating healthy, it's that we want more kids graduating from high school like everything you can possibly imagine. And that's, that's okay to have those goals and to see how 
arts and culture and health and transportation can help you solve those goals that are really crime prevention, you know, but crime prevention is very complex, needs a lot of partners to do that. So we had meetings, they, had a, they used this building a lot for meetings and public sessions, and we did our visioning, um, what they would like to do to turn their neighborhood around. And so the first idea was, let's just do a street fair, let's do a harvest festival. And they did this in Kanyanga Lake uh, last, they had like a, a block party. Let's do a block party um, in our community. And they closed the street. We got them these banners. We set up tents. And the idea was to bring the community together. So the first round of ideas was block party. Let's just get everyone together and, and talk about our neighborhood. But the idea was then to generate more activity than just the 20 people who came to that meeting, but to get everyone um, in the neighborhood to come out. So we had a harvest festival. So it was like October, and it's cold, and it's Detroit. And we got tables and chairs donated. And we had little pumpkins, and we set out tents outside. And we invited everybody. We invited everybody except the police. And the reason we did that was that there are a lot of members of this community that are involved in illegal activity, that are involved in drugs, and that are everyone's neighbors, children, nephews, nieces, kids. So they're part of the neighborhood. And it was a strong feeling that they wanted everyone in the community, even those that were not contributing positively to it or that were in trouble or doing dangerous things, to be part of this conversation, that they were community members too. And they said, if the police come, these guys won't. So everything was fine. Um, and we set up more tents. They had to come in and give us ideas to get a chit for the free food. Usually we like to incentivize this. If you give us your ideas, you, you win a chance, um, whatever somebody is giving away, to a night in the hotel or a free meal at a local restaurant. Um, just some sort of incentive for people. You get a bagel, you get a button, something that is a reward for people doing that. So they got more ideas, and it was like, if you want a food ticket, you have to come in and give us your ideas. And then we did all this crazy, lighter, quicker, cheaper kind of fun stuff. We did a hayride. We did pumpkin painting and face painting and barbecuing and cooking outdoors. And as you can tell, it was a little, just a little warmer than it is today. I think the most expensive thing we got was the bouncy castle. And there was a bicycle repair um, stall, stand, and half-court basketball. And people were out there, you know, for half the day generating, celebrating their community, and getting us the next round of ideas. And this was, some of it took place at Peaches and Greens, but Peaches and Greens was sort of like the hub that all of these, to have these, all these conversations as well. This was a building next door to Peaches and Greens that people used to hang out at, and they wanted to kind of turn it into more of a, of a clubhouse. So there was additional funding and opportunity to do that. This is a local artist painting his own mural there. Um, and now this is where people come out and they play chess and they play checkers in the summertime. Oops. And then we had to do a plan. So this was kind of the plan for the vision. So you see peaches and greens, P and G is in the middle, but then there were opportunities to turn a vacant lot into a park, to do sidewalk improvements, curb extensions, uh, more crosswalks to connect gardens and neighbors to the street to get it easier, to make it easier for people to cross from one part of the neighborhood to another. So there were street-related improvements, public space improvements, business improvements, design improvements as well. So this is it sort of before, and here we are after, where the building got a facade improvement. But there's now a commercial kitchen inside, so people are doing value-added food production, cooking classes, they're starting healthy food uh, startup businesses in there. There's more meeting. Um, they have SNAP and WIC and EBT as well. And they, still, and they have other meeting rooms. So they've really taken it to the next level of becoming something that is also part of helping the community generate income for itself as well. So these are all the partners in healthy places. These are all the goals we have about social connections, healthy food, walking, biking, natural environment, play, and active recreation. But we found that these five key factors um, that would improve people's health are also part of creating great public spaces. And these are the social determinants of health as determined by the World Health Organization and the Healthy People Initiative of 2020. 
uh, vulnerable and disadvantaged people uh, who are people who are too or poor or under-resourced or elderly or disabled uh, members of communities of color are the groups that we think about most in public health because they tend to have less access to improving these determinants um, in their life. So creating great public spaces with those particular groups in the forefront will actually make the most difference to people's health if we consider um, those that um, need it the most and have the least access to it. So these are some of these um, social determinants of health in the top. It's a little blurry because I took it, took a picture of it out of a report. But the examples of the physical determinants on the bottom are about access to the natural environment, um, access to transportation, what happens in the work sites, um, exposure to toxic substances, physical barriers, and aesthetic elements such as lighting and trees and benches. So these things really do intersect. Social determinants are transportation options, physical determinants are transportation. So really have to look at the social and the physical at the same time when you're looking at determinants of health and how to improve that. So support social connections. There's a lot of evidence about the importance of social interactions and support networks to our individual health, not just mental but physical. So, um, social connections are connected with decreased levels of stress, longer lives, and even improved pregnancy outcomes. One study in Canada found that a sense of belonging actually leads to healthier behavior. But at the community level, social connections build social capital. The social networks among neighbors, which is about trust and mutual aid, create more resilient communities. And you see this after natural disasters. Communities that have more social capital and are more socially networked and have more people that are doing, that are involved with Sullivan Renaissance, doing planter, do better after disasters because they start fixing stuff even before the Army Corps or FEMA show up. So really, resilience and sustainability at the community level is based on networks, connections, and mutual aid. I have um, a little, I'm a member of the Upper Bostock Road Neighborhood Association. It's this online neighborhood group, and it's like, hi, I need my driveway shoveled, and hi, I don't feel well. Can someone pick me up and take me to the doctor? And it's just this, and if you're available, you just go and you help out. I've never met these people physically. We haven't ever shared a meal but where you probably have these two, but it's just sort of we all live in the same neighborhood and, you know, do you know a good electrician? So those kinds of things, even at that level, um, are very helpful, building community and networks. There's more um, intersection painting. Neighbors within two blocks of each of these intersections have a stronger sense of community, expanded social capital, and lower depression rates after the project after this was the intersection painting project. So we're like, oh, it's traffic calming. Oh, the Girl Scout got her badge. Her little brother can walk to school. It's like we didn't realize that it actually makes the neighbors happier. Um, and the neighborhood and the community has a stronger sense of itself because of it. That was not the outcome. The out I mean, the, the intent was slowing traffic, but the outcomes are myriad um, and health-related that we really weren't looking at. So always looking at those unintended positive outcomes and consequences is good. So creation and participation create uh, in community groups and garden groups strengthens people's ability to take care of themselves and their health and socialization and leadership. And these are wonderful leadership opportunities for young people, high school students, teenagers. They can be a force for good or a force for evil. Um, and we know that in a lot of communities there's this fear of the brain drain and the 18-year-olds leaving. But what we don't know is, what we don't realize is that 35-year-olds are moving back in um, with jobs and families and a little bit more disposable income and careers. You want the 18-year-olds to go. They're like Vikings. Put them on a ship. Let them sail around the world for four years. Let them learn some skills. You know, get out of the house. But once they get settled, they've got a degree, you want them to come back. You want them to come back in their mid-20s. You want them to buy a house and raise kids. And when they're connected to their community, and they've been involved in the farmer's market or a mural project or a battle of the bands or they've helped design a park or they were there, you know, painting, you know, the, the striping out the basketball court on the parking lot or 
anything even more meaningful than that, even as simple, they will come back because they will have a sense of connection. And you want them to have that sense of connection to your community before they leave so that they'll want to come back. So it's not the brain drain. It's about recapturing those young people, giving them a reason. The reason to leave is there, the reason to come home. That's what you're looking for, the reason to come home and the reason people are moving to your community who are not from there originally. Um, yeah, so we're always really looking at the youth as a way of bringing them back. Um, so this is about 60 minutes a day for children. We did 30 minutes a day for adults, I think is what Mark Fenton was talking about. So we love sand beach volleyball. We love it everywhere. It's really fun. Um, this, is, this was after, do you remember the big earthquake in Christchurch, New Zealand? I think it was about 10, 8, 10 years ago. So what do you do? Disaster, what do you do? Uh, you do a dance on mat yeah. They transformed a vacant parking lot into a dance mat where people could come. You hook up your iPod and your phone music, and you can have an instant dance party. And there's, um, uh, there is other photographs of members of the royal family um, doing dances here. We have worked with FEMA. They have a new community development specialist team. And what they do, you know, when you, after a disaster, what people really miss is the sense of place and sense of community. And what we try to convince FEMA to do is to spend money on rebuilding those sacred, cherished community places, whether it's Court Square in Springfield, Massachusetts, or it's the beloved historic library or a theater or it's a view shed, or it's the gazebo, whatever it is that people feel what defines your community, what's the most important thing in your community, fix that first. That gives people so much hope and so much resiliency when they see what they love most restored. They know that they have a hole in their roof and they know that winter's coming and all of that will take place. But when you drive down Main Street and that wonderful thing that, you know, that school or that shop or whatever it was that you really cherished, you know, the Performing Arts Center is getting rebuilt. You feel better about your community as a whole. So we say tie it to the sense of place and do that work first. We'll see if they do. They'll have lots of opportunity, believe me. Um, proximity matters. You know, in New York City, they have the... the Bloomberg was saying that every kid needs to live within a five-minute walk from a green space or a park. I mean, it's great if you can get there. So proximity, not just having these beautiful parks and spaces is important, but being able to get there. Um, but even creating it, if you don't have it, you know, doing things on playgrounds, um, transforming pavement, a parking lot can be turned into a playground, encouraging kids to be active, hopscotch, whatever. Um, also doing this in parking spaces. I know if there's especially if there's not a lot of traffic or it's a neighborhood street, but putting, you know, creating these pop-up playgrounds. Also, hula hoops, very popular, very inexpensive. Cornhole, a lot of these games are really readily available. Um, you don't have to have a... They're building a $10 million playground in Market Street in San Francisco, a $10 million playground. They got a grant. There are no bathrooms. I'm like, oh, good luck with that. Hope that works. You know, but if they had $1,000 or $100, they could have done this or had a yoga teacher teaching kids. And this is really fun when you're thinking about, we need amenities. We need these, these uh, furnishings and these functional attributes. Um, we, can we design them to encourage movement where the garbage can is in a basketball hoop, so you have to jump up to put your garbage in there. Um, and bicycle racks are for dances. It's kind of a fun idea. Utah movement. People who live closer to parks and green space, we know their property values are higher. We know that their, their houses um, are more valuable. But they also have lower markers of inflammations related to ailments like heart disease and cancer. So your property values go up and your inflammation levels go down. And in Toronto, there was a study that found that neighborhoods with many street trees, the residents there had lower levels of depression, diabetes, stroke, and heart disease. And I think it's the possibility of the trees and walking under the trees, and the trees provide shade and canopy. And in Sweden, they showed that 
the more often and longer people spent in a green space per week, the lower stress they reported. So a lot of this is self-reporting, so we understand that. But in Philadelphia, a recent study found that by walking by greened lots in a rundown neighborhood reduced people's heart rates. That was a physiological finding. And a lot of these studies are in the um, Healthy Places report that PPS just released. I know there's a link to it. I know I've shared that somewhere. But it's also on our website, pps.org. Exposure to nature helps kids reduce symptoms of ADD, um, but also providing opportunities for kids to play without adult interference. Um, I love these like extreme playgrounds. There's, I don't know, it's not broken bottles and broken glass and twisted sharp pieces of metal, but these adventure playgrounds are really, you have to, you know, it develops kids' motor skills and ability to work together and sense of danger, but creating places where the kids can go play and the parents can go have a coffee nearby. Um, walking and biking, we've talked about a lot to incorporate physical activity. But we first have to transform our streets. And you can do a lot with paint. You can do a lot with paint and cones in the middle of the night with a few friends and a bottle of tequila. <laughs> it's, I mean, we were going to do that in, well, in a number of communities I visited yesterday. I won't say, I won't give it away. Um, but it's about reallocating the street space to meet a community's needs and right-sizing it and designing the street for the context that it's going through and basically using transportation to build communities rather than building, building transportation through communities. Uh, this is a small town in California. It's a state highway. State highways will do this. Um, you have to get to the right person in the right district often, but they're doing more of this. So Caltrans, the state DOT, was doing a routine maintenance project on the street. And working with the town, the town convinced them to totally reconfigure how the street was used by striping it differently and adding a bike lane. They're already resurfacing it. They're already repaving it. It's like, well, can you restripe it also for a bike lane? And usually the DOT will say, well, you know that's going to cause traffic. And they're like, uh, we have like four cars a day. We don't really care. So the, often, not always, the DOT will tell you like, oh, my God, you're going to have traffic congestion. You know, you're going to have level F. Level F is freaking amazing. Le level F means you've got traffic and people are shopping and walking and coming to your community. Level A means cars are moving through, zipping by, not stopping, not shopping, and just passing by you. So level F, level D is, means a more, it's a better pedestrian. Um, it's better for pedestrians. So we don't know why they don't have those level of service, pedestrian level of service, as well as automobile level of service. And we do a lot of brainwashing of traffic engineers and bringing them up to the 21st century. And we have a website that we run for the federal highways about context-sensitive design techniques. So none of this is rocket science. But if your traffic engineers have been praying at the altar of the Astro Green Book for the last 50 years, there's a new messiah, context-sensitive solutions. The Ashto Green Book are recommended guidelines. They're recommendations and they're guidelines. And you know what happens when you have streetscape guidelines? They're ignored. They're always ignored. And design guidelines, ignored. For some reason, with the Ashto guidelines, they are adhered to as if they are the Ten Commandments. There's a lot of flexibility in there, um, and we know people that can help you push your traffic engineers to think about that, to build streets that support communities, because traffic racing through your town meets no economic community development goals at all. So here's another little bike lane, back in angle parking. Back in angle parking is actually safer than front in. So I know in diagonal parking, it's it's often a battle. Unless it was grandfathered in and it was always there, then you can get it back again generally. But back in angle parking, thinking of it, okay, so you back in, you've got kids in the back, you open the front doors, the kids are protected from running out into the street by the front doors. So backing in is, is more difficult, but you open the doors, the kids are protected, and then when you pull out, you can actually see the cars coming. So back in is actually safer. And you get more cars parked on a street when you do the diagonal parking. Um, we've seen this. This is in Bogota, Colombia. Crosswalks for life. Um, painting crosswalks where, where people and children were killed and hit by, um, hit by motorists. Bringing community together and saving lives. So what can you do on streets to improve people's health? This is the transportation piece about transportation. If you tell your transportation engineers that it's about safety, 
for people and not vehicles, they will, they will more likely go for it. But basically, streets can be everyday parks and playgrounds, and anything you can think of in a public space or a park or a square, can, or even indoors, um, can happen on the street. So these are fitness equipment on the street as well. Um, talked a lot about alleys. I love this. There's a lot you can do in alleys. This is just a volleyball court, strung up again. Two walls of an alley. Um, we've seen basketball hoops in alleys in Vancouver. Um, and if a car comes through, it's easy to drive under. If a truck comes through, I guess you have to take it down, so you have to do it when there's no deliveries. Um, but you can work that out. But this is retaking street space um, for people's space. And signage that's, that encourages people to be active on the street. So this is um, Roseanne Bach Designs and Architect. Designs fun signs designated um, parts of the street as activity zones. So this one is about lift your shopping bag. And it's just lift your shopping bag. There's one about jumping jacks, um, jumping rope. And people walk down the street and they lift their shopping bags. And they're thinking about fitness and looking at their daily routines as opportunities to make healthy choices. I know that when I carry home very heavy grocery bags, I try to do a few little curls while I'm walking along. Um, I don't know if you have parking day. It's the third Friday of September. It happens all over the world where you take out a parking space and you make it a park or a plaza. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity for voter registration. It's an opportunity for a nonprofit to give out information about programs that they're running. Um, landscape architects set up a little display, or people just kind of put out some AstroTurf and have a party. And it just shows the value of these parking spaces, which I've been talking about as valuable uh, space and is a utility that needs to be metered and managed and better used. Because if you have a car sitting there for eight hours and you have a place where like 25, 30 people um, can sign up for voter or get their blood pressure taken, you've got a much better use of parking spaces. It's just about thinking about those spaces and parking differently. Serving the cars or serving the population, serving the community, serving the community. Recreating streets for special events, um, just Again, this is in, this is Bastille Day. I don't think there's any French people here, but that doesn't matter. They're playing patank. And this is just several, you know, cubic yards of sand and some two by eights and using the streets for parties and plays and playing and anything else you can think of. You can fit on a wider sidewalk. You can fit, it can be something that leads to health and activity. Um, then talking a little about healthy food and beverages, access to food is a social determinant of health, as we know. And we were talking about sort of the added activities that relate to health at farmers markets. Um, and one of these is, you know, health clinics, clinics and testing at the market. This is a cooking class and demonstration, it's, it's wonderful when you have opportunities for people um, on food stamps to buy fresh fruits and vegetables. But if it's not part of their cultural background, they may not know how to prepare them. They may not know um, what to combine them with or what they're going to taste like. So having cooking demos to make people feel comfortable with fruits and vegetables and with these kinds of new ways of, of eating or how to prepare fish. You know, so helping them actually buy the food, prepare the food, understand it, learn about the nutritional value, and have all that happen at the market. This is a youth, um, a youth program. There's 30 youth a year. It's a nine-month intensive program. They operate a half an acre garden. They support other community gardeners, like often seniors. They sell at the farmer's market. They have life skill classes, and they earn a living doing farming. And when you're talking about nutrition assistance programs and incentives, the key is that food for sale at a farmer's market must be made affordable. So these programs make it affordable for people to buy healthy food, to eat healthy. Um, but this is about a market as a place. This is a small community um, in Washington State. And when they have the farmer's market, they also have traditional dance performances. They have basketball. They have a community supper, there's buskers, there's juggling. So the farmer's market Thursday night is like a big event. 
The market is just one piece of 10 things happening. The community coming together and celebrating its culture, and you can ride your bike there as well. So it's always layering these things. It's not just a two-hour market. It's a market that has a community supper and juggling and music and concerts and beanbag races and anything else you can imagine. So we go to Healthy Places, Physical Activity. This is a dance um, class on a plaza that is being under renovation in downtown Baltimore. Social interaction and connections to people that are different from you in a space where everyone is welcome and has the right to be. Feels inclusive, greater sense of community, safety and security, because safety and security, a lot of it is perception, and the way to make a space feel safe is to provide activities and reasons for everyone to be there. Because a public space that is not programmed or is not well designed will be taken over by people that want to be in a place where there's no one else around. So it's not about displacing negative activity. It's about creating the indicators, the activities, the amenities, the uses that attract a broader range of the population. So Bryant Park in New York still has homeless people, but they're not the only people in that space. And they want to be part of the action, and they want to be part of the scene, and they're part of, of what makes that a special, interesting, inclusive place. So, civic it's another one. Civic engagement. Um, this was a community that decided to take over redesigning its street and did a lot of work with the de transportation department and their, their city councilor. And here they are. They, they got permission to have a planted median. So they're out there planting it, and it's all zero escape because the water department in their town stops watering the plants in July. So they're doing zero escape um, low maintenance drought resistance planting in the middle of the road. So to be most successful, create a place that attracts a lot of people to it where they can make lots and lots and lots of healthy choices. Um, so we need to think about what people or what want or need when they're in the space, how to access the space, and how to encourage them to spend time there. And we find that our friends in the health world um, kind of don't look at those activities that aren't directly related to health. But, you know, the play streets I showed, it's wonderful, um, but it's also good to have those other layered activities um, that support sitting and water and access to food and amenities as well. This was a, a project in downtown Providence, Rhode Island, and they started doing a lot of programs with kids and reading programs for kids and focusing on children. And we asked Debbie, why are you focusing on kids? It's a downtown space. It's a historic park. There's lots of employees all around. Oh, she said, oh, we're focusing on kids so the office workers will feel safer. So they're doing things. So they had this, like, lovely young um, gym, like yoga instructor doing kids' yoga. It was all about kids and families to make the office workers feel safer. So that's something to think about, to kind of turn it upside down. Um, I will take some questions, and then... I wanted to have us do a little group exercise. That's okay. If we still have time, I don't know how much, I don't know how this, how we end up here. If we all come back together and there's a closing, I'm not really sure. Okay, so do we have any questions, first of all? Yes. when there's not a lot of people in the, in the town center? Well, there's a few things, a few um, tactical solutions you can do. Um, one is that, you know, putting a bench out is really, it's really an, an art form. It's not as easy as it seems. So to put a bench out in front of a business where the customers are more likely to use it, like an ice cream store or a coffee shop 
um, or even a, a bank maybe where someone's going to run in, post office. We were talking in um, Kanayanga Lake about putting a bench and a platform out in front of their post office so people could come out and read their mail because it's a really nice sunny spot. So you don't put it in front of a law office. You put it in front or a fine dining restaurant. You, you know, it's like in front of a business where it's more likely that that customer is going to use that bench. Um, often, we, if the benches, we, they are, need to be sort of light and flexible. The merchant brings them in. We have situations where there's an outdoor cafe, and the tables and chairs are out all day. So by 11.30 a.m., when the restaurant opens, they have been occupied by people who are not customers for the entire morning. And we say, okay, well, why don't you put out the tables and chairs when you open? When your first customer shows up at 11.45 or noon, someone in your business puts the chairs and tables out so that they, those amenities are tied to, to the users. And then if your crowd dwindles at 2, 2, 30, 4, you bring them back inside. Um, so it's strategically knowing when to move those things around. They have to be movable and flexibly and easy to, easy to lift up. To, to serve those customers. Then if you have like a nighttime concert or there's an event, maybe the merchant puts things out again at 6 o'clock. So that's kind of one way to start um, showing the benefit of those amenities in a situation that you're not quite yet at the tipping point. Um, the other is to find out why these people who are hanging out downtown, why are they there? What are their needs? Is it because the shelters close at 6 a.m. and kick them out and they have nowhere else to go? Um, is the library available? Um, you know, what... Are they, if they're, if they're people that were recently unemployed, would they like a job? Would they like to be an ambassador? Can they help um, a merchant do something around their place? Can, you, can they be employed? Um, if they need help, if they have a, a drug problem or an abuse problem, you know, can we contact the local public health or a social service provider to, to help those people, if they need help, go get the help they need? We've had a number of situations where the people hanging out in the plaza are now the ambassadors that open it up in the morning, put the chairs and tables out, call the police on their friends when their friends are acting up, um, and have totally are now partners with our, this nonprofit organization that runs this plaza. So it's, it's really kind of looking at the dynamics um, within that situation and try to kind of understand how each of these pieces work together. So I hope that's... And then figuring out why there's no one downtown during the day, you know. We, Buffalo, I know, has a lot of, like, there's Chippewa Street. Bars, 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 restaurant, restaurant, disco, disco, bar, bar, bar. So 4 o'clock, dead, dead, dead. You know, 5 p.m. to 4 a.m., very lively. And we were talking to Mark Gordon there about sort of like, well, changing the mix, having a bookstore and a cafe and a clothing store and a supermarket or a drugstore that would actually have things happen. We've even seen it where it's like it's a bookstore, cafe, bar. The bookstore cafe is open till about 6 o'clock, then the bookstore part closes and the bar opens. They're about kind of sharing the same space. So equalizing out the hours, why, why are there no um, businesses that are attracting people there during the day? So it's, it's kind of a multi-pronged strategy. It was a very long answer. I hope that helped. Yes. Yeah, I don't, we don't go to the highway department right away. Um, we sort of work with a group of partners or a nonprofit or the Girl Scouts or a community association or a neighborhood association, a group of individuals that hopefully are related to, you know, the highway traffic engineer or the mayor is a sister-in-law or something like that. So it's usually a community group that says we have this problem and we would like to we would like to basically stencil, you know, maple leaves in our intersection to slow traffic. And we've had 
a lot of, you know, we've even had arts organizations working with the City Department of Public Works um, to do that. We say it's an experiment. You can, you can do not only spray paint, you can do spray chalk. And the chalk lasts about three months. And you say it's a pilot and it's an experiment and we'd like to do this because we want to slow down speeding and you're not going to give us a traffic light and you won't give us a stop sign. But we need a way to make our people safe. And we would like the permission for three months to try this out as an experiment. And we've actually had the Department of Public Works and the police with our with our friends, the crazy artists, as they're spray painting maple leaves, you know, on neighborhood intersections, so that they're part of that process. And they see it happen. You're not asking them permission, you're actually asking them to be a collaborator and a partner in helping you solve a problem really inexpensively um, as an experiment. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We did this, this was one neighborhood in Indianapolis, and this, the chalk was down. And we saw the bus, you know, the bus is coming up the street. And these were just maple leaves in the intersection. And we're like, oh, God, you know, the bus, it's like it takes at least a half an hour for it to dry. The bus is just going to go right through our maple leaf. We're going to have to spray paint it again. There's going to be white chalk on the back of these tires going all the way up the road. The most amazing thing happened. The bus driver saw this. They've been driving this route for years. They went around the maple leaf. They sort of thought that it was sort of like a roundabout and they went around it as if it was a physical object. We were like gobsmacked. We couldn't believe that. Um, so it, it is partners, but it's like we have a problem, and this is. And you can show precedent. They've done this in Portland. They do. The, there's all these amazing images all over the the internet about these sort of traffic calming projects that happen. Um, but it has to be where the the engineers are part of that solution. And I guess if, you, if your first level is the county, you go to the county. But we like to go with the town highway department or just somebody who's a little bit more local. Then go with our local guy to the county if we need, if we need that approval. Or you don't start on a county road. You don't start on a state road. You start on a town road. You see how fabulous it works. And then you try to convince the county and the state to try it there. But it's an experiment, and it's a pilot. Those very important words. Um, and if it doesn't show positive results, it goes away in three months. And if it shows positive results, you want to look at how to make it more permanent. So the tequila it was just a joke, the friends with tequila. And I've always wanted to do that, but that hasn't happened yet. Yeah, Maureen. Ah, outcomes, outcomes and impacts. Very good question. Um, it's hard to, it's often hard to measure over a short period of time. Um, many of the projects that we do, we start, we get base data, but we don't really see results till about at least a year, year and a half, and then three years out, and then five years out, it, they are exponential. So the results you have in six months are not going to be nearly as exciting as the results you're going to have in a year and a half or two years. These things kind of, if they're incremental to put together, the outcomes and impacts are also incremental, which means you have a longer term, you have a longer time to actually measure it and document, but getting the baseline, you know, as you're sort of starting or right before you start doing the changes is important. You can always do surveys. You can always uh, have people tell stories. Narrative works. And this sort of work, which is sort of sociological, environmental, psychological, it's not all about hard numbers. It's not about, all right, our vacancies decreased by 80% in 15 minutes, and our rents went up by $400 in five seconds, which are not necessarily the kinds of indicators that are positive for a lot of communities. Um, but, you know, the fact that, um, yeah, I, I came here once, and it was so great, I came back four times. I've been here four times. Um, what do you do when you're here? You can survey people. Well, I'm just coming to the concert. Well, this time I went, stayed at the Lazy Pond, and I had dinner in these three restaurants, and then I went to the concert, and on my way home, you know, I'm going to check out Jeffersonville. It's like, oh, so you prolonged your visit. So surveys, intercept surveys are good, and that's where you can get the hospitality industry involved, even um, hotels, restaurants, casinos. We were working with the, um, the Mohawk Nation in Akwesasne in the North Country, and we were, we were training the guys that pump gas. Um, and sell cigarettes. When people come in and go, what is there to do here? Not to say, oh, go to the casino, but to say, have you been to the traveling college? Do you know there's a powwow this weekend? Have you visited the longhouse? You know, have you been to our museum? 
to basically be ambassadors to help people experience a community more. So intercept surveys are good. Um, narrative stories are wonderful. Um, that works. And then talking to merchants and business owners is, you know, has business improved? So a lot of it can be anecdotal the first year or so, and then you can get to more hard numbers. And then it also depends on what you're trying to prove, like what are your outcome, like what are the goals? Like if you want to say we are now a healthier community, um, so what, are the, what is it that you want to be measuring in order to do that? It's like, well, we want people to stop smoking. So then you go to the corner guy and go, hi, so how are cigarette sales doing? Really down. I really haven't, I mean, I'm like not even going to carry them anymore. No one is smoking anymore. Okay, you can probably figure out how many he packs he, he sold the year before. So those are some indicators. But it's important to know what you want to measure, what the outcomes are, so you don't, you're not measuring too much. And then whenever you start measuring, you always realize there's another whole level of things that you really wanted to measure that you didn't realize you wanted to measure, which is okay because you can do that um, in year two. And then who's the audience? Is it your funder? Is it a health funder? Um, is it... Um, a corporate sponsor, who, who's your funder and what is it that they want you to measure? And if someone is asking you to measure and it's a grant or it's an award, they need to pay for that. Do not let them have you pay to do your own measurement and your own evaluation out of your own grant. It's just not enough money. They need an independent evaluator and I don't know if it's Getty or if it's Robert Wood Johnson, whoever it is, pays for the evaluation. And you want to work with that evaluator as a partner and a collaborator so they understand you and they're measuring the things that are important and not like, yes, there were 75 jobs created here. And you're like, why are you measuring that? We don't care about that. Well, that's a standard met metric. We're like, that doesn't have anything to do with health. Why would you spend time measuring that? We had that with one project. That, so you want an evaluator, an independent outsider, independent insider, someone who understands you, paid for by your grantor. And stories and pictures go a long way. OK, Maureen, that was a really long answer. You're welcome. I hope you all took notes. All right. OK, so we're going to um, just have you, I guess, just in two groups. I don't know. We want to group you together, we wanted you to think about these questions. Um, what physical elements and features are needed, do you think, to create a health, to help create healthy community places? Um, what are the programs, events, activities, learning, and networking that can take place? Who are the partners? I don't know. Maybe we're not going to do this. Wait a second. What do I have here? OK, let's do this instead. Is that all right? You, you've all, you know all the answers to that. I wanted to, can I tell you about my little tool? Let's move to the tool. Is that all right? Changing the plan. Okay. The tools are here. I haven't given them out. Um, yes, if you want to So the healthy places, the healthy places, the healthy places booklet is basically, we wrote like a, I don't know, hundred and something page book. These are the action exercises under each of those seven categories of social in, of indicators of health. So that's just like if you want to look at food, you look at this, sociability, you look at this. So that's a little action packet for you to take home with you. The other thing is our healthy um, places tool. And we, we, take, we did this um, yesterday um, in Kanyanga Lake. You basically take a group of people like this, you divide into groups of like no more than five, five place, five people, and you go out and you assess a place based on these qualities of place um, in terms of uses and activities, access and linkages, comfort and image and sociability. And these are agree, disagree questions. So this is how you understand, and it's really, it's about focused observation and training people to look at public spaces with a critical eye. You do this in mixed groups. So this is like if you're all architects and landscape architects, you take off those hats. Um, you do this, we can do this with kids, you can do this with seniors, you can do this with um, civic leaders, uh, attorneys, lawyers, 
um, and teenagers, it's really about mixing up the groups because it's really about our human perception of a space. But it takes that, those, it, these, these innate qualities, intangible qualities, like I don't feel safe here. And you sort of, this is about symptoms. Why don't you feel safe? Oh, um, there's no lighting. The streets are hard to cross. Um, there are, there's people hanging out on the corner, um, and I don't know where I'm going. Okay, okay, those are reasons why people don't feel safe. So those are physical things that can be adjusted to make people feel safer. Um, so we have these ratings. And when you have something, and we were looking, you know, if something is a disagree, there's a farmer's market. You know, I disagree. Maybe that's something that you want. Or in some places, yes, we have a farmer's market, but we only have it four months of the year, and it's fabulous. Okay, what would it take to have it eight months of the year? Well, we've got, you know, the, we've got this, this fire department that's empty most of the time. Maybe we could move it in there. And maybe it's not fruits and vegetables, but maybe it's cheese and meat and prepared products and knitted teddy bears. Teddy bears are knitted by, from recycled sweaters um, and perfume and jewelry. So you kind of look at these things that are like um, not doing really well and see how do we make them better. Uh, we were talking yesterday in Kanyanga Lake about, yes, um, healthy food is produced here. We make a lot of great stuff. Is it available locally? Hell no. We export it to the city, you know, and we're eating Cisco or whatever. Um, it's like, well, that's a problem. You know, why isn't it available locally? Well, uh, we, because our producers don't think there's a market here. Well, how would they get to it? Can we have it? There's the Cornell has this wonderful Healthy Communities, Healthy School program where they go into um, the corner grocers and they go into the gas stations and they say, can we put the bananas and the oranges by the cash register, the candy bars in the back, the cigarettes as far out of view as possible, um, the home-baked products and the homemade jam up front, and they try to sort of reconfigure um, these gas station interiors. This is a thankless job. I know Melinda's involved in it um, from Cornell. But basically to make those, even those little places places that can be healthier. So you can even, without even going out to a site, you can sit around the table with your, with your friends over coffee and sort of think about these ideas. So once you sort of do this rating, um, then part B is looking at, is that part B on here? No, I have to go to part B. Um, yeah, part B is you're going, okay, we've rated what we've got, and those are more like to look back to. What did we disagree? What was bad? Those are the things you want to work on first. Um, list 10 places in our community that support the health of a broad spectrum of the population. Our rivers, our lake, the mountain, um, the schoolyard, um, the arena, the skating rink. Um, okay, what 10 places have the potential to support the health of these populations in the future? The police station in Newburgh, Oregon where the women go to have their Zumba class because there's no place for the gals to take Zumba. And they walk into the police station, they go, yeah, we paid for this with our taxes and we pay your salaries, by the way. We need a place for Zumba, get out of the way, we're coming in. So they do Zumba in the police station, it's also the safest place in that community. The fire station, hopefully empty, not busy, ever, 99% of the time, um, in, in Houston, Texas, um, Navigation Boulevard in the Third Ward. Kids go to the to the fire station after school, and the firemen, I think they're 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 salaried, tutor them in their home with their homework because these kids are after school. They're latchkey kids. Their parents aren't home, so they go. Okay, we're going to go to the fire station. You're going to do your homework, and the firemen, who are hopefully very bored, um, are going to teach you. And it also is a wonderful thing because it shows men as mentors to young people. So those are public spaces. So how can your fire station, your police station, your library also um, support the health and just become really, really leveraged public spaces that really serve more than just one population, criminals or houses on fire? This doesn't seem to be the best use. So then you think about, okay, what are these great places? So that's your network analysis. And then I say network analysis, but it's this is all... I'm just using jargon, which I don't like to use. 
Um, and then opportunities. So think about the five potentially healthy community places like the police station. We, want, we have a new trail going in. It's actually a rail trail conversion in the town of Olive. And they're like, we need bathrooms on this 11-mile trail. I go, are you kidding me? There's two police stations and two fire stations, and I am peeing in the police station. And they're right across the street from the trail, and there should be a sign that if you need help, the bathrooms are there. Not building bathrooms. Don't need $10 million. Use these facilities. I want to, I want to use those facilities more my police station. So how could they be improved right away? What changes would you make in the long term that would have the biggest impact? Um, we were in Monticello, and we have the senior center, and we have the farmer's market, and it's like, well, we were talking about the farmer's market, selling food, and having dinners at the senior center, and doing cooking classes there, um, but also building a community garden outside of the senior center and then having farm-to-table uh, meals at all the restaurants on that day um, around the farmer's market. And it's just layering and synergy and mushing things together um, all the time. So then you kind of think about longer term, and you build, you build on these things. And then who are the partners? Because as you know, we cannot do this alone. We need the partners, we need the vision, and then we find the money. The money finds us. But who are the unlikely partners? We often go to artists and creative people because they have great ideas. Um, and they're often around during the day because they don't work in offices. Um, and we go to librarians because librarians are used to doing way too much with no resources. And they deal with you all in the public, like 75 to 100 people a day. Um, and librarians, you know, libraries are so much more, as I said, they're, my, they're about people, they're not about books. But, you know, to look for those, like, unusual partners and opportunities, one little healthy places story while, before people come in, um, Richmond, B.C., Richmond, Vancouver, B.C., um, a lot, has a lot of fabulous, fabulous Chinese restaurants, and there's a lot of fabulous Chinese people moving to Richmond, B.C., and a lot of them are older, and a lot of elderly Chinese people have a predisposition and a very high rate of diabetes. So the medical healthcare community was looking at this influx of a population with a predisposition to a, you know, to a major non-communicable disease, NCD, of diabetes. How do we reach these people? We're going to have an epidemic on our hands. And uh, the, per the administrator from the hospital was talking to the head librarian um, at a community meeting. And the librarian said, you know, in our library, we actually have um, a calligraphy class on Tuesdays, and we have this lovely Chinese woman who speaks Mandarin um, and Cantonese, and she teaches calligraphy. And every Tuesday at 4 o'clock, we have like 70 to 100 elderly Chinese people at this calligraphy class. And the hospital is across the street. So every Tuesday at 4 o'clock, the hospital administrator or nurse comes over and greets their target audience where they are and talks about diabetes care and prevention and says, if you are not feeling well, this is who you should, and they actually teach them how to in, inject insulin, um, and they teach them all about diabetes, and the Chinese calligraphy teacher translates, and then they do their art class. So they found a way for absolutely no money at all to reach a population, and they did it through art at the library with conversations between the librarian and the health administrator. So those are the unusual partners that we're trying to get you to think about. Um, and just to be very creative and think as far out of the box as you possibly can. All right. Thank you for your time.